and other data structures that we'll actually look at today and then use in practice in the coming weeks. So, this was again a photograph of Mather, and this is an example of a stack of trays. And we photograph this simply because it's representative of a very common computer science data structure that known as a stack.、Uh, a stack is a LIFO data structure, last in, last out.、Uh, sorry,、uh, la uh, wait a minute. Last in, first out, LIFO,、uh, last in, first out. And as you might infer from reality, if you put a tray on top of the stack, well, unless you're, I mean, an idiot, you're not going to go and take the bottom most tray that was first put there. Instead, you're obviously going to take the one on the top. So this has actually very useful implications. I alluded to just one fairly arcane one involving validating HTML, but this ability to have a data structure that allows you to incredibly rapidly add to it. Really in constant time, big O of one, and then remove from it also in constant time, big O of one, is a powerful technique because we've been dab、uh, dabbling so far with array based data structures and others where we often need at least log n or n. So, really, today and onward, we want to approximate or achieve constant time. So, if you have a data structure like this, a stack, What do you need? How do you go about implementing this? Say and see. Well, the only syntax we have thus far for creating custom variables, custom types, is a struct. So if we were to start typing struct stack and then an open curly brace, and we want to clump together one or more data types that to collectively define a stack. Much like an ID and a name and a house collectively define a student, what do we need to be able to keep track of? If suppose we want a stack not of trays, but let's keep it simple a stack of integers. I want a data structure where I can put a number and then a number and then a number and then a number, and I want it to be easy to get at the most recently added number. What could I put inside of this struct and then start calling the whole thing a stack? What might you propose? Again, the goal is to store numbers, integers, and a stack of them. Well, what existing data structure can we kind of steal to implement at least part of this idea? Yeah. OK, a y so we could use a linked list. We could use a linked list, which we looked at on Monday, which is a dynamic data structure that allows you to grow and shrink your data structure as on demand when you need more memory. And in fact, we could even regress a bit more. We could use even the simpler. Array, right? And that would actually kind of conceptually be pretty consistent with a stack because much like these trays are all right next to each other, so would an array of integers be right next to each other. But of course, what's the downside of using an array really for most anything? It's a fixed size, right? It might be fine, but you're either going to spend way more memory than you need by over allocating and then just wasting it, or you're going to under allocate. And in that case, you then end up wasting time. Because if you allocate too few integers and you need more, you then have to call malloc again, but with bigger,、uh, a bigger number. And then you have to copy your old data into the new. And then you typically have to call. Free on the old array to give that memory back. So we can have an array, but if we just have an array of numbers to represent a stack, we need at least one more detail. So here is how in C we might represent a stack. So recall that typedef defines your own type, a synonym of sorts. Struct says, here comes a bunch of data types, collectively call them the following. And then the word at the end, stack, is just the arbitrary but conventional name we want to give to this data structure. And I propose, even simpler than a linked list, we could implement a stack. With just two data members. Previously, again, we implemented a student with three ID, name, and house. A stack might just be an array of numbers, an array of integers. Capacity is probably a constant, sharp defined elsewhere to be some number 128, 1000, something arbitrary but big. And why do I need to know about the size? And semantically, we mean a slight distinction here. Capacity is the total capacity. How many total numbers you could put in here? So, what might size actually represent in a context of a stack? Yeah, how many things are actually in there? So, initially, capacity might be a big number, a thousand. So, that gives me a thousand integers potentially in an array, but initially, there's nothing in there. So, I at least have to remember for this data structure stack that its size is zero. And then, anytime I add a number to this stack, Well, what are you really doing? You're going to add a number to the array, and then another one, and then another one, and another one. And so long as you remember how many times you've inserted numbers into this array, it doesn't even matter if there's a whole bunch of garbage values. Because if you do it in order from left to right, or conceptually from bottom up in the array, so long as you remember the size that it's zero or one or two, you know that the first, no, those first integers are legit. And the rest might be garbage values. But there is a problem here. What happens when I insert the 1000th and 1, for instance, number into this data structure? What, what would you do in that case? 
what you say, I mean, seg fault, you might. If you just blindly、uh, go past the boundaries of this array by going to capacity or capacity plus one or plus two, you might very well seg fault. So, in the worst case, you might have to either just accept that, which is not good, or two, you might have to actually re implement this thing using malloc. It's probably not ideal to statically allocate that many integers inside of your structure because, in this definition, you can never regrow it. Because I'm not using pointers here, because I'm using a Hard coded array. I can't just call malloc or realloc later. So, this is a design decision. And again, when we talk about these axes along which we grade problem sets, design takes these things into account. If you are comfortable with the design constraint that you can only have, say, a thousand numbers in this stack, well, maybe that's actually quite fine. But if that's not acceptable, well, then we need to re engineer this. And we do need to use malloc or pointers or somehow to get that dynamism, or as you proposed, use a linked list. But these are trade offs. Like, what might be the What's the first trade off that comes to mind if I propose, all right, let's scrap this and let's actually re implement this using linked lists so we don't have this upper bound? Just instinctively, like, what's the downside of that approach?、Uh, yeah, I mean, this is totally legitimate. It's harder, right? We saw Monday, and I deliberately didn't even go through all of those lines of code because, you know, it's like 100 or so lines to collectively implement those linked lists that we first simulated with humans. But if you actually code it up, you need an insert function and a delete function. And you glimpse toward the end of Monday how relatively complex the code was. You had to handle insertion at the head, at the tail, in the middle, deletion at the beginning, at the end. And it's all doable. And that code is, in fact, correct, but it's just a lot of work. My God, I know how to use arrays and, like, Week two, here's the implementation of the data structure. Now all I have to do is index into that array using some square bracket and dot notation. Done. So, this too is a valid design constraint, especially in the real world. If you can either implement something that solves the problem in an hour, or you can solve this problem and many others in a week, you, know, you have to decide for yourself what's actually worth it. And so, one of, the, one of the goals of the final project, too, is going to try to rein in your own ambitions. And you'll be asked to propose that you'd be happy with, say, this good version of a final project, and this better version of a final project, and this best version of your final project, because realistically, you can sort of imagine. Implementing the whole world and every feature you might imagine. But as you've seen with problem sets, just implementing one seemingly simple feature can sometimes waste or cost you some five hours of your life because you just don't anticipate the things that arise. So getting better at estimating difficulty and time will be one of the key features of that process. So here is, for instance, a queue. And a queue is a、uh, FIFO, F I F O, first in, first out data structure. And this one in the real world is certainly more fair. right? So, you probably, if you get there early again, you want to be the first one let into the store, not the last. And so, a queue has its own applications. And here, too, a queue could very reasonably be implemented with、um, a fixed size array. right? For instance, if this is some kind of giveaway where they only have a finite number of iPhones or iPods, well, they don't need to let more than, say, 500 people in line because the 501st person is not going to get. Into the store. So it's sometimes, whether in the real world or in a program, might be totally reasonable to bound the size of your data structure. So again, we could implement this thing called a queue, perhaps a little something like this, where we have another array called numbers. It too is initialized to capacity, whether that's 500 or 1000, whatever, it's a constant. But this time I have to keep track of two things potentially. Two things. Whereas the stack is kind of nice and simple in that you add a tray or add a number, add one, add one, add one, add one. And then as soon as you remove one, it just comes off the top, off the top, off the top. Notice what's staying constant. The first thing you put in is staying where it is. Your elements are going up and down and up and down. But in a queue, it's a little different. Because suppose in a queue, some, someone gets in line. And then another person gets in line. And then by 5 a.m., you have like 10 people in line at the Apple store. And then they start opening the store. But the queue's not filled, right? It could still wrap around the block. But those first few people start to go in. Well, in the real world, the rest of the humans who arrive later are going to probably shift in line, right? So the, the end of the line, the beginning of the line is always the same, but the end of the line is kind of moving here. And so when it comes time to implement something like a queue, We can definitely remember its size, how many people are in line right now, how many integers are in this array right now. But if we want this thing to be dynamic, in that we're implementing it with an array, and in our array looks like this, where I'll just draw it as our typical array, and I'll put in something like,、uh, let's say,、uh, Alice, 
And this is Bob who gets in line, and this is Charlie who gets in line here. And I still have spots for two more people in this line. Well, as soon as the store opens, Alice is effectively going to be taken out of line. But if we're now implementing this notion of a queue in, prog in a program, You know, we could move Bob and Charlie all the way to the left. And every time someone gets into the store, we could shift them all to the left. But what's, what's the design concern with that approach? It's an O of n, right? It's kind of expensive. Every time we pop someone off the queue, we potentially shift everyone to the end of the array. I mean, that might be nice and clean, and it makes for nicer pictures if everyone's kind of moving up in the line. But really, in programming, we could just remember where the start of the line is. So rather than assume that the start of the line is at bracket zero, just now update some index variable, call it.、Uh, What do we call it here? Call it head for head of the line, and just do plus plus and remember that Bob is the head of the line. And you know what this now represents? The end of the line, right? We can reuse this memory so that when this person and this person and then the next person come in, we don't have to kick them out of line. We can say, OK, a y fine, go here. But in computing, we can just remember that the head of the line is somewhere else so that we can avoid this expense of potentially big O of n for shuffling people around. So in that sense, implementing a queue. It's actually a little more complex because we have to keep one、uh, more piece of information around if we want to implement things efficiently. So, notice here the trade off. And this is a very minor trade off. But by spending 32 more bits for one more int called head, we can avoid spending what as a resource? Time, right? And this is a constant thing, especially this week and next week, and even with the final project. You have so often in、uh, programming this trade off between, well, if you spend a little more time, you can save,、uh, rather, if you spend a little more space, you can save time. Or vice versa. And the first time we saw this, I think, was with merge sort. Remember that merge sort was blazingly fast compared to bubble and selection sort. But the little dirty secret was we technically needed an extra array. And that's why we left more space on stage for all of these milk cartons, because we needed some temporary space to actually merge the elements into. So we spent twice as much space, but my God, we went from n squared to n log n, which we saw multiple times was just, was just much faster. So there's this theme of trade offs in terms of space, in terms of time, in terms of difficulty. Or human time spent implementing, all of these are legit resources. But the Holy Grail is going to be a data structure that lets us just put stuff into it and take stuff out of it. In ideally constant time, right? If you don't care about this notion of a queue or this concept of a stack, all you care about is having some kind of black box into which you can put stuff, and then you want to be able to get it back out by saying, give me the, let's say, give me the student with ID 13 or give me the student with ID 16. You don't care how this black box is implemented, you just want the answer to come back like that. Now, you can obviously implement a black box with an array and with linear search, but again, in the worst case, if you want to get a student. With some ID, it might be at the end of your array or at the back of this black box, so it could take big O of n time. But the goal today is, again, constant time. So, how might we go about implementing this? Well, the spoiler is that it's going to be called a hash table. But how we actually implement this magical black box is a little more interesting, if non obvious. 